Welcome, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Ho, and I'm director of the Hawke Centre here at the University of South Australia. I'd like to welcome everyone here. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on Ghana land. We're in the red kangaroo dreaming place of the Ghana people. We respect their connection to land, to country and to the spirit of the land and thank them, especially the elders, for the opportunity for us to meet today. I'm really delighted um, to join together with the social innovator dialogues uh, this evening in, in presenting uh, this address. I think it's very important that we focus on innovation. This is the lifeblood of society that we keep looking at our problems, looking at how we can solve those problems, looking for the way forward. And this collaboration, the Social Innovator Dialogues, involves the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, the Centre for Social Impact and the Australian Social Innovation Exchange. So that's a few organisations, but I encourage you to find out more about what they're doing. In particular, they bring international thought and leadership and expertise into Australia through a series of events. And these are often cutting edge thinkers and doers. And the series addresses the big issues affecting decision makers across the public, private, and third sector. So for us at the Hawke Centre and at University of South Australia to be part of this evening is, as I said, um, very, very welcome. Could I ask if you uh, could turn phones off? Uh, we are recording this evening's events. And to give you an outline uh, of what will happen tonight, um, our distinguished speaker, Dr. Taraf Youssef, will speak for approximately 30 minutes. He would like to have a lively uh, question and answer session. And um, I would just ask, as, as the chair, um, that we do have questions. We don't have long, tedious statements because the democracy of the event is that as many people get to ask a question as possible. So if you can treat the Q&A session in that spirit, uh, we will be most grateful. There will be roving mics. This isn't the easiest venue to ask questions in, but there will be a roving mic that comes to the hand that I've identified as being the first and the next question. So if you would like to start thinking, please do so. We're going to have um, the video of this event and the audio available after the event on our website. So please be aware of that. If you have friends, colleagues, associates who would like to partake of tonight, at least they can do so at a distance later. I'd like to acknowledge a few people in the audience tonight. Uh, Leon Bignall, the member for Mawson. Alex Brooking, the State Director for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Brenton Roneberg, Chairman of the Australian Arab Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And Rebecca Millard, the General Public Relations Manager for World Vision. Together they represent uh, a variety of interests and indeed you as an audience represent a huge variety of interest from business to education to cultural relations and international studies. So we welcome your interest. I'd now like to um, briefly introduce um, our distinguished speaker. Dr. Tariq Youssef is CEO of Silatech and formerly Professor of Public Policy at the Dubai School of Business. 
Dr Youssef was the founding dean of Dubai School of Government from Georgetown University, where he held the position of Associate Professor of Economics in the School of Foreign Service. And he's also been the sh at the Sheikh Sabah Al Salem Al Sabah Professor of Arab Studies at the Centre for Contemporary Arab Studies. He's a leading authority on the economies of the Arab world. He has a PhD in economics from Harvard University. His current research interests include the dynamics of labour markets, the political economy of policy reform, and development policies in oil exporting countries. His research and policy experience includes working as an economist at the Middle East Department of the IMF, visiting professor in the MENA region of the World Bank, and senior advisor for the UN Millennium Project. Presently, he is a senior fellow in the Wolfenson Centre for Development, Brookings Institute, and the Belfast Centre for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. So I think you'll agree that's quite a biography. <laughs> Could I now welcome him to the podium? Thank you. Thank you for the kind invitation, for the overly generous welcome, and to the members of the University of South Australia, the Hogg Centre, the Centre for Social Impact, and the Innovator Dialogue Series for making it possible for me to be with you today. I'm immensely honoured. I'm grateful for the turnout. Uh, I've only arrived in Australia less than 24 hours ago. So I'm adjusting to the difference in time zone and the other adjustments, mental and psychological, one has to do with you enter into the issues that we will be discussing shortly. But so far, I have been incredibly uh, happy to be here. I've told my friends at Cisco who have so kindly arranged for this trip that I have never traveled so far and felt so welcome and so uh, relaxed about being uh, in a place. And I think a lot of this is due to Australia, what it stands for, its people, their friendliness, their warmth. And I hope in the next 30 minutes uh, you will allow me and indulge me in discussion over issues that I might admit from the outset are projects in the making. Uh, I think the broad title that was chosen for today's talk is The Arab Spring, What Happened and What Happens Next. Uh, issues that I think the world is finally coming to terms with after the shock and awe of the protests, the revolutions, and the ongoing unrest in a number of countries. What I'm going to try to do in the next 30 minutes is hopefully outline the story as I see it from my own vantage point, that of a development economist, that of a policy analyst. But perhaps I should start out initially by being honest with you and telling you where I stand on all of that you see in the Arab world today. I am unabashedly, unequivocally, and positively optimistic about the region. I've never been more excited. I've never felt more proud to be an Arab. And I think the region has finally, in over perhaps two, three hundred years, has felt a sense of empowerment, control over its destiny, and with a hope for the future possibilities that are good for the region, for the people around the region, and for the world at large. So that's where I stand at the outset. I've taken this position on day one. I've done so in public. And as I was reminded today by a friend, I did so even at an expense of my own, perhaps, professional and political standing with many others who may not have felt the same way about the protests and the uprisings that started. So the story I'm going to tell you really starts about a decade ago. Post 9-11, the tragic events of 9-11, which unleashed a lot of soul-searching within the region 
as to what happened? How could it happen? Or what does this actually mean for us as people, as a region? The soul searching, as you might recall, triggered a lot of discussions outside of the Arab world, especially within North America, but not limited, within Europe, within many parts of countries that felt vulnerable, felt unsafe, and worried about the future, especially given the magnitude of what had happened. I think for me as an individual, 9-11 was an incredibly uh, shocking day in more ways than I would like to actually recall at the moment. It made me come to terms finally with who I am, how others see me, how the world is going to judge me, and what does this mean for my children and those that I work with or happen to subscribe to the same set of backgrounds, beliefs, and views of the world. 9-11 triggered a body of work that emerged within one or two years of the tragic events of 2001. Many of you in the room, and I'm just guessing by the average age of people I see around, might recall some of this works that emerged post 9-11. The soul searching exercise. What happened? What underpins 9-11? How could nations, societies, be so unsettled, so upset, so angry, so as to direct that anger in this awesome fashion, in this bloody fashion towards others thousands of miles away. Post 9-11, a series of studies, reports, were undertaken by a number of important international institutions. International institutions that relied extensively if not exclusively, on people from the region to, to, to try to provide a diagnosis. What is happening in the Arab world? What are the sets of issues that are driving people to be either be happy or be angry? How could this be prevented? What does this mean for the future? I was privileged to be a part of one of the teams of scholars, researchers from the region, who had set out to try to organize the agenda. How can the Arab world, to the extent that these issues were homegrown, driven by degradation, lack of empowerment, poverty, unemployment, political disenfranchisement, what ought to happen, what should be done, what are the sets of priority issues? I think a number of the reports that came out early on in 2002, 2003, very nicely summarized our state of knowledge at the time. And broadly speaking, these reports at the time suggested that with reference at least to the past 15, 20 years, so starting from the mid 80s, all the way to the early 2000, 2001, 2002, what one can say with some measure of certainty is that by and large, the Arab countries had gone or had been undergoing a period of slow, if not in some cases intensive, economic, social, and political stagnation. Notwithstanding the oil boom of the 70s or that that followed in the early 80s or the rapid expenditures that were made in education, healthcare, and infrastructure, this is a region that was falling behind consistently for at least a decade, if not two. And that in fact, in order for the region to be able to resume economic growth, join the world community, address pest festering problems inside of these societies, a number of issues had assumed a priority. One, issue of just job creation, employment, and opportunities for the publics of the region. Two, integration into the world economy through markets and ideas and connectivity and tourism. Three, 
dealing head on with issues of gender inequality or gender equality and female empowerment and entry in the public space. Four, educational systems that not only were not keeping up with times, but were consistently creating the lines of unemployed and un underemployed in these economies. Four, governance issues in all their forms, whether it was public sector governance, meaning public administration, government effectiveness, delivery of services, or big governance issues, inclusive governance, participatory governance, accountability, transparency. I could add a number of issues, but I would just stop here and say the magnitude of the development challenges facing this region from the perspective of a decade ago, looking at the previous 20 years, was already suggesting to a lot of us looking at this that something needed to happen. And it needed to happen now, after two decades of below average, unacceptable economic, social, and political outcomes. The key magic word that emerged out of many of these reports and discussions in many ways was that it really was about comprehensive change. The region needed to undertake the process of inward focused, comprehensive change to improve outcomes, to improve the process, to change the ways of doing such outcomes. And some of the, the ideas that emerged in my view, looking back a decade ago, seemed to make perfect sense. Why did you need comprehensive reform? Because you never engaged in it for about a decade. Problems had gotten more complicated, the cost of inaction had risen, and the potential for this to destabilize societies was becoming obvious by the day. The very process of how you undertake this change needed to also be amended. Given the nature, the makeup, and the structure of policy in a lot of the countries we're talking about, most of the reforms in the past that we had looked at were essentially top-down reforms. Reforms by decree. Reforms that kept the public out. Reforms that required the acquiescence of the ruler and the ruler only. But also in the process became hostage to his mood, his reading, his own calculus. That kind of reform produced what? It produced hesitant change, patchy change, and most of the time, reversible change. In other words, it lacked credibility. It really could not sustain the policy changes required, let alone address a comprehensive battery of policy changes which everyone thought were needed. The reform process finally had to also be accountable and transparent. I don't think this will surprise you, but the makeup of societies in the Arab world in many ways is no different from many of the other neighboring countries. For historical and for geopolitical and also for accidental reasons. Let me be specific. Most countries in the, in the Arab world have been structured around the state playing a pivotal, if not dominant role in the provision of services, in the guaranteeing of welfare, and ensuring certain economic outcomes were felt. Whether it was a job for life, subsidies for fuel, low cost for foods, and a certain social peace, all of these were guaranteed, agreed upon, became the norm in the minds of the public, became almost a culture within the societies of the region. And as a result, the only change that would be viewed as credible and would engage the public was one that will be transparent and where there will be accountability. And where, in fact, you will engage the public in 
the sort of national dialogues to arrive at a new conventional wisdom. I actually was pretty optimistic in 2002, 2003 that change might in fact happen for a couple of reasons. It was the post 9-11 environment. There was immense pressure on governments in the Arab world to make change. The Western countries, the US in particular, had been pushing for a new way of doing things, at least initially. Two, one of the biggest sustainers, levers for governments to maintain things as they are, to maintain the status quo, was essentially oil resources, as most of you would recall. And oil resources at the time had been hovering around $20 a barrel and were forecast to stay at that level for the next decade by just about everyone we had spoken to. So a very important source of stability for governments to maintain things as they are was in fact dissipating. Third, there was also broad engagement by intellectuals in the region calling for change. 2003, 2004, at least I made the grave mistake of assuming that this might be just the right time for things to move in the right direction. But just when you thought that was the case, a couple of surprises came along the way. One, the US invasion of Iraq and its ramifications for the debates that will take place about change within the countries. It became very convenient for Mubarak or Ben Ali or any other ruler in the region to say, this is what the world means by change. Everything you're seeing in Iraq that is scaring you is exactly what they have in mind for you. It became very easy for them to label those who called for change, including yours truly and many others, as being essentially instruments of global capitalism and American imperialism. Hence, the very intellectual body of work that underpinned that debate, that internal discussion, became discredited. Three, the, the so-called war on terror had unleashed, yet again, the national security implications, sensibilities, of every government in the region, thereby changing the debate from being one about economic change, social change, policy change to being one about repression, political manipulation, political control, and the top-down management of the very process of change. I think it was that mindset and those sets of policies that had essentially undermined, if not fatally wounded, the early discussions and the early hope for change that many people had championed and wanted to see in the region. But more was to happen because the problems that I had just talked about just a little while ago did not go away. I would argue, in fact, they became, as I suggested earlier, more complicated more intractable, less easy, or less uh, within the ability of governments to influence by throwing money at them with higher oil revenues or other redistributive policies that many of these countries had so perfected over the years. In fact, we began to see in the Arab world new forms of policy we would never thought we would observe again, given the strong middle-class orientation of these countries, given the sense that government is there to manage, responsible to ensure, as opposed to there to engage in flagrant, systematic acts of corruption, as we would see subsequently as part of sort of the whole market orientation of the world that the Arab world chose to be a part of. We saw the reproduction of autocratic practices, so Mubarak was getting his son ready, Gaddafi was getting his other son ready. The very Republican regimes that came to power 30, 40 years prior to restore, in, to restore equity and to ensure social justice became in fact the biggest violators of
of basic public sensibilities. We saw growing marriage between politics and money in a way that uh, is quite typical of, many, uh, of much of what we've seen elsewhere in the world. But I would say in the region in particular, uh, that marriage became increasingly overt, increasingly, increasingly expansive, and increasingly at the expense of economic opportunities for others. We saw the manipulation of politics, amending constitutions, changing the rules of elections, just to ensure that those in power will stay in power, will ensure that those who wanted to come to power will in fact be able to, so, to do so. We saw for the first time, I would argue, in about 50 years in the region, growing signs and indicators of inequality. With inequality of wealth, inequality of opportunity, and even inequality of outcomes that was being noticed, recorded, and witnessed, not in the rural parts of Egypt, but in Cairo, in Tunis, uh, in Rabat, in the very heart and uh, political bedrock of many of the governments in the region. Finally comes 2008. Now, the effects of the 2008 crash on the region has been much understudied and much underappreciated. I don't think we were immune as people would like to believe. A number of financial crash implications or the post-financial crash implications are worth noting. One, as many of you who recall, the explosion in commodity prices and fuel prices that took place, directly going to the heart of the middle classes in a number of the countries that have just experienced political upheaval. Two, a number of these countries had also real estate and financial bubbles that came unwinding in the aftermath of the dislocation that followed 2008. Much of this went either unrecorded or unnoticed, but so, and certainly publicly not as well discussed as it should be. But it was there. In my humble opinion, it was the cumulative effect of these shocks, existing problems that finally created the possibilities for the sort of explosion in the streets of Cairo and Tunisia and Libya and others that actually took place and surprised everyone. Two groups in particular, in my view, formed a coalition of the willing or a coalition of the accidental in this process, the youth and the middle classes. Now, I did mention a bit about the middle, I did say a few things about the middle classes. Let me just say something about the conditions facing Arab youth because that has been part of what I've studied and written about in the last 10 years. It is not an accident that Arab youth championed the change more than anyone else. Two-thirds of the region's population is under the age of 30. By any metric, and I've looked at about five of these and tracked them over time, this generation has been failing its own expectations, its own hopes, its own credentials on each one of those metrics. The unemployment problems that we had mentioned just a, we suggested a decade ago were ripe for a social crisis, in my own opinion, had gotten worse over time. And it became much more than a just, just about getting me a job. It was getting me a, a job that was stable, that paid me a decent wage, that allowed me to have a quality life. Many of you are I think familiar with the ongoing debate in the U.S. at the moment on this specific issue. This has been an issue on the front burner of our countries for at least a decade, and the roots of which go back at least a decade prior. Two, education. Not only were there no uh, modernization attempts done to educational systems in the last 10 years, but increasingly public education systems 
were failing to deliver not only tertiary education that was acceptable to those who would offer jobs or to the very recipients themselves, but even primary and secondary education was increasingly failing to keep pace with expectations. Three, housing. This is a region with all of its wealth, all of its oil, all of its state-led projects, probably had the highest housing shortages of any comparable region around the world. Affecting especially who? Young people. Connected to all of this, in my view, is one of the most understudied and possibly, possibly pivotal issues in this, and that is marriage. The Arab world remains uh, societies with strong conservative norms, with strong values that affect family formation and interaction between the sexes. Just a few years ago, the last year for which we have probably reliable data, the age of marriage in this conservative region, the age of first marriage, was the highest in the world. That led us a couple of years ago to essentially describe the condition of Arab youth as one of exclusion. An entire generation, not just a small segment of the population, but the pivotal, the critical, making up a very significant size of the larger demographic structure was completely excluded and increasingly lacking confidence and faith that it will have its opportunities. I don't think under these circumstances it was an accident for the youth to lead these revolutions, but for them to also be supported by the middle classes in underpinning what we thought were durable regimes, stable regimes, and regimes that smart men and women around the world looking at internal political stability had bet on their longevity. I think the Arab Spring of 2011 must go down as one of the biggest surprises to any pundit, analyst, or long-term forecaster of trends within countries. Because of all of these issues, however, it would be unfair to claim that it was only economics that undid these regimes or only the lack of opportunities for young people that may have in fact finally triggered the anger. I think it was a combination of all of the factors I had mentioned and it was only fair that in the streets of Cairo and Tunisia and Yemen and Libya the calls became calls for dignity, opportunity, fairness, and justice. Fifty years ago, when a number of these regimes emerged out of the, in the post-colonial era, the irony is they all came in many ways on the back of these very slogans. These became the, the, the very in, issues that would undermine them, discredit them, and demonstrate at the end their fragility, their fa frailty. Now, looking back at all of this, uh, I still have to remind myself every morning, given what I see, given the uncertainty I observe, given the uh, growing anxiety outside of the region and within the region as to the course of these revolutions, I have to remind myself that these events were possibly the most, most important events in our region's history in a, in a couple of hundred years, to say the least. They're important events among other consequences because they've restored the sense of empowerment. They've restored the sense of dignity. And they possibly, from a public policy perspective, have given us a chance, just a chance, not a guarantee, at doing what we couldn't do for the last 34 years. And that is to engage in the sorts of 
project for reform that will be genuine, that will be sustainable, that will be acceptable to the public. The only reforms to the sorts of problems I had mentioned in my talk so far are reforms that combine economic change with political engagement, that truly allow the public to engage in the sort of dialogue to arrive at a new conventional wisdom. After all, the old conventional wisdom, which had served the region well for so long, had run out of steam a long time ago, and now we essentially just have our chance to do it right. If that is the only reason for which the Arab Spring took place, I would say, this is good enough for me. This is all we wanted. At the end of 2010, I recall vividly writing an article in which I was prepared to write off the region from modern history on account of what I was, the trajectory of the processes I was seeing within the region. I actually almost changed belief and started thinking, well, maybe we can all be like China. Maybe there is no room for such thing as public participation in a dialogue or accountable, transparent, democratic processes of change. Maybe this is all an over-sell, an over-exaggeration. Maybe Bernard Lewis was right when he said the Arabs are programmed to want a strong man to rule, to not have any tolerance for public discussions and, and debates that are frivolous after all. I think the Arab Spring and the changes underpinning them have not only debunked a lot of these myths, but have possibly given us the golden opportunity to give the people of this region a chance at catching up with history, being seen by others as equal, sorting our own problems without needing to constantly, rightly or wrongly, blame others for all ills that take place within. What happens next is something we have not thought through. So what happens once you dismantle these regimes? How do you, in fact, win the process of post-revolution, social, political, economic rebuilding? How, what happens meanwhile? What surprises could also undermine the project of rebuilding? I think these ought to be the questions of the moment. And they're not easy questions, nor are they questions for which there are easy answers. What I am sure of is that within 10 years, given the right time, the right conditions, and the support by people within and outside, we can get to that promised land of having societies that are stable, fully prosperous, at peace within, and that produce economic and development outcomes that rise up to the expectations of the very publics they are meant to serve, and that hopefully serve the world at large. Between now and then, this road untraveled, not just less traveled, it's untraveled, at least in this region, is going to be subject to a lot of potential hiccups, surprises. Let me just outline a few of them. One short-term economic conditions in a number of the countries going through change. Egypt and Tunisia are not doing terribly well economically today, partly because of the conditions of protest and unrest. These short-term economic conditions, which can become a full-fledged economic crisis if they don't get necessarily they don't get the necessary financing if the world doesn't step up to help them, or if the world economy continues to unravel in the way we possibly could be seeing it do. These economic conditions can worsen. And when they worsen, they will complicate the agenda for state rebuilding 
for a national dialogue, for elections. They will complicate it and could potentially undermine it altogether. I think the focus on the promised land need not imply that we should not be addressing the immediate needs, issues, and in some cases, dire circumstances, especially in countries that don't have any oil and are vulnerable to what happens in the world economy. So the economic short-term issues are not to be underestimated. Two, I think the politics that's emerging right now is also new. The political space, after decades of being closed, manipulated, managed, is open. There are new players in this space. There are new actors. They will form new coalitions. We don't know exactly what the outcome of this process will be. Yes, there will be a lot of Islam and politics in it. There will be a lot of tribalism, possibly, a lot of identity politics. But we've never had any kind of open, competitive, genuine politics, so we have to accept this process of evolution to some extent. We have to guard it, we have to protect it, but we have to accept it. I am one person who continues to be a bit surprised at what I read in papers when one sees analysis that suggests that the Arab Spring is about putting Islam in politics. This is what this entire exercise is going to be about. Nobody should be surprised that Islamic parties were the first to emerge, the first to contest elections, the most organized, the most mobilized. They were the only ones to have survived in the sort of political repression that took place in the region. Two, they bore the brunt of the repression that took place in the last 30, 40 years. Many of them have evolved with the times. And for them to have a stake in politics, a big stake, is not something to necessarily frighten us. It should make us wary, it should make us cautious, but it should not frighten us. This is not the recipe for how the Arab world will evolve in the next five to 10 years. In my humble opinion, the, the winners in the political game that is being unleashed in the Arab world are those who can deliver on the issues I said, I mentioned earlier. Can you restore the quality of public services? Can you create or discover or re-oil the engines of job creation? What will you be doing about education systems? What's your stance on gender equality? The parties that will win at the ballot box over time will be the parties that make the most to address these needs and goals. Third, or the third issue to note about this short-term concerns are the external environment. The Arab Spring has taken place at just about the worst possible time from the perspective of the world economy and the focus of the superpowers outside. Foreign aid is out of question, at least in the magnitude that it are required for some of the countries that need it. Domestic politics is all about domestic economic policy. No one has any stamina to engage in the new messy politics of the region. And there are no carrots that are being put on the table for the new emerging governments to help them anchor what they do. As you recall 21 years ago, one of the best things the European Union did to the countries that were the newly democratizing countries of Eastern Europe and, the, and, and Eastern and Central Europe was to offer them the promise of joining the EU. One of the side effects of this, in addition to it being a genuine interest, was to anchor everything they do within, to be in harmony, to be in, consistent with the goals of joining the EU. That was a huge carrot. No one 
is offering the countries of the region right now any sort of carrot. No one is in a position to do so. The, pol the internal politics and the global environment is such that, that many of these countries are essentially on their own. Now, that is empowering at one level, but it's also, uh, it creates potential risks in more ways than one would want. Finally, one of the distinguishing features about the timing of the Arab Spring, which also enhances possibly the risks, short-term risks, and the 10-year horizon risk, is that we're at a moment where, in fact, the world is engaged in a soul-searching exercise over what is the model for how states and markets work, for how you deal with entitlements, for how you deal with public sector welfare provision, for what stance you take on globalization and trade. The world at large is engaged in an act of soul searching over the very model which five, ten years ago we took at face value and took for granted and promoted. The countries of the region are going through a profound moment of change when the world not only is not in a position to help them economically, but may not have anything intellectually to offer as a way to go forward. That creates infinite possibilities for policy mistakes, policy mishaps, and for projects of political management and economic reform that might not necessarily be consistent with the long-term scenario that I had spoken about earlier. That is the uncertainty that worries me. It is not Islam in politics. It is not sectarianism or tribalism. It is the intellectual context in which this takes place, the lack of readiness, lack of appetite for engagement by the outside world, and the emergence and the opening of politics with too many players, too many coalitions, creating possibly too many scenarios for things to be messy, to be volatile, to be unpredictable. And finally, the last issue that I would note that worries me in this process, as you begin to reform and to engage and change, is that the re this reform process, this process of change, restoring equity, justice, leveling the playing field, economic opportunity, has to be protected from the very elites that might want to undermine it or capture it. The people in Libya who served Gaddafi have not left. The economic interests, the bureaucratic forces have not left the scene. They are still in the system. They have every reason and every incentive to undermine the process of change. The same is true of Egypt. The same is true of Tunisia. Hence the interest at the moment in accelerating the political transition to ensure that whoever is in office is legitimate, has come through the ballot box, and has a mandate to rule with. I think if we can, I don't want to say aid or help, that might be too much to ask at the moment, but if we can appreciate the complexity of what the Arab world might be going through at the moment, for the next 12, 18, 24 months, as more governments become elected and genuine, and are able to do things that are needed, I think we can be sure of the long-term viability of the Arab Spring. I go back with where I started uh, in saying that, at least for me, as an Arab from this region, this, uh, the Arab Spring is one event that I never thought I would live to enjoy. And just to be able to go through Kennedy Airport in New York, or London Airport, and not have people staring at me, or to attend round tables in Washington where the Arab world is being discussed, 
and not to see everyone, what everyone around the table throw the wildest of presuppositions and make the most irrelevant of judgments about the region and the people of the region in the way that they did prior to the Arab Spring to me is a breath of fresh air. The region for the first time possibly in modern history has restored its own confidence in itself and I would argue has restored its, its own dignity in the eyes of others. And I think the young people of the region have made it possible uh, for us to be here and I salute them as I ask all of you to salute them and thanking them for bringing us to this point. I'll stop here and I'll open the floor for a Q&A. Firstly, thank you so much for um, sharing your views on the Arab Spring. My question is, seeing what we've seen so far, there is a presumption the Arab monolith is a simple, simple being. It's not. It's made up of so many factions, so many parts, so it's not one beast. Do you see the, the cure to so many Arab issues increasing democratization or simply changing the clothing of the emperor, as we've seen in Egypt? Thank you very much. Great question. Uh, if you probably have noticed that I did not use the term democratization or democracy as much as maybe people expected. And I did, I did so on purpose. Uh, Partly because in a, for a lot of people, democratization tends to often be judged by what happens at the ballot box, by the elections. Uh, and yet I would argue that what happens beyond or aside or in addition matters a lot more than the elections per se. Note, a uh, case in point would be Iraq. Iraq had a genuine, fair election post uh, the invasion and uh, the deposition of Saddam Hussein. And yet, Iraq arguably emerged as an incredibly corrupt, partisan, uh, sectarian, and a violent society. I think to the extent that what you mean by democracy are changing the rules of the game, uh, then I would uh, wholeheartedly agree with you on it. And I think that, that is more in harmony also with the notion of justice and dignity and, and fairness. It is about the rule of law. It is about accountability. It is about transparency. And I think those uh, are part and parcel of the larger democratization project we're talking about here. So I fully uh, agree with, unless we change the rules of the game, we can very well fall back into business as usual. After all, there are built-in incentives and biases for more of the same, for the status quo to be kept and sustained. Could you speak to um, the possibility or the, the contribution that people like writers and artists and musicians and intellectuals could play in shaping the direction of the Arab Spring in the future? Uh, I think they've got a critical role. Uh, I would say the word critical doesn't capture the importance of their role. Who's going to articulate the vision of a new Arab world for the people of the countries going through change? Uh, who is going to debate the options and help move the discussion in a direction where societies that have never governed themselves will learn by practice to engage in the kind of discussion we're having today. Uh, I did note in a number of recent engagements in a number of countries going through this change that even the very mechanics of a debate, of focusing on an issue or arriving at a set of conclusions is something that we have not done before. We have to learn from scratch. I think the role of intellectuals here becomes incredibly important. After all, uh, I think they uh, uh, they are the actors who will help intermediate between the public and, uh, and government and can help uh, essentially inform and educate and also call into question uh, violations, transgressions, or uh, things, policies that are not within uh, the spirit of the change that people want. So I think we need to restore the role of the intellectual uh, and, and, and the place of the intellectual in our societies, a lot of the intellectuals I know of from the region 
have lived abroad for the last 30, 40 years. We have to, I mean, the first thing we need to do is find a way to bring them back. And uh, I think my goals, as I've been explaining to a number of people, is not to wholesale import them back, give them an incentive to just spend time with us. If we can buy a month or two uh, out of the, the, a scholar's uh, commitment or an intellectual's commitment, I think that is good enough and that's a start. Uh, this is not to underestimate the wealth of, uh, of, uh, of the intelligentsia we have within, uh, but I think there is a lot more that can be done in this process. I'm, I'm quite pleased that a number of my own colleagues from Washington and elsewhere have now run for office in Egypt and Tunisia, are holding public office and are bringing a, a new spirit of youth and renewal uh, to, to what they do. My name is Fuzzy Trojan. Um, you mentioned that um, Europe and America are preoccupied with their own economic issues and social issues and don't have energy to give to the Middle East. Um, what about China? Do you think with all its foreign reserves and uh, relative stability it might fill some of that vacuum? How would the local people view that? A great question. I think we need to send some of the representatives of the new governments to Australia to teach us how to deal with China. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we know we understand China well. I think China's own track record on the Arab Spring has been uh, a bit patchy, if not uh, outright uh, problematic from the perspective of a lot of the publics and the new emerging governments. There is a bit of sensitivity in, in Libya, for example, today. I would expect the same to happen in Syria once Syria goes through the full cycle, for them to view China as a partner in this process. I think China has a lot of work to do to uh, not win, I don't think China will be able to win the hearts and minds of the public in the region, but to convince the region that it, it is going to side with the interests of uh, the people of the region. Uh, after all, I think it was President of Tunisia who one day said openly, I want to be like China. I think there's a misunderstanding even in the region as to what China is about. Uh, so President Bin Ali of Tunis, and I think maybe Bashar Assad had, had suggested it, uh, that China was about you know, economic growth but no political rights. And I think Zain al-Din Bin Ali suggested this uh, as his focus because he thought, well, China is obviously a successful uh, model and if we could just focus on economic growth and delay or postpone everything else, uh, then we will be able to achieve uh, uh, sort of the same uh, level of prosperity and maybe maintain social peace because that is best done through government management. So I, think China, uh, I, I think China has a role to play. China will be a vital economic market and a source of, of, of goods and investments for a lot of the countries, but I, uh, I just, my instinct tells me that in the post-Arab Spring, China has a long way to go before it is able to actually credibly engage. Uh, for all their faults, their shortcomings, Tunisia and Egypt still look to Europe and the US for help, for aid, for technical assistance, for engagement on a lot of these issues. And I think my source of frustration is for policymakers in Europe and in the US, what happens now in these countries is not just priority five, or six or seven, it's probably priority 20 or 25. And there is a, a danger that things could slip on the economic side too quickly out of their hands or they would lose the influence that would allow them uh, to help the, the new elites who are emerging and ruling to anchor their reforms in a way that is in harmony with the realities of, of the world they live in. Uh, thank you, Ralph Clark. You spoke of your fears or concerns about the remaining elites in Libya and elsewhere of slipping back into power or hanging on to the powers of, of, uh, in those countries at a later date. But what concerns, if any, do you have of them being assisted by the United States and their client state Israel and in interfering and undermining these democratic reforms, uh, particularly when you're given their track record in uh, Iran in 1953, Yemen, uh, and the refusal to deal with a democratically elected Hamas in Palestine only a few years ago. What hope do we really have that the United States and Israel will keep their noses out?
Uh, it's a great question. It's worth reflecting on, uh, if only because of the historical record of outside powers in the region. Uh, let me pick one anecdote, one important decade from our prior historical record that might shed light on why you've asked the question. Many of you recall that Abdel Nasser came to power in 1952. The former president of Egypt inaugurated Arab nationalism, Arab socialism, and Arab antagonism with the outside world. That was not what he came to do on day one. He came on day one to restore fairness, redistribute land, promote Egyptian independence, and to serve the public of Egypt. Over the course of the next eight years, from 1952, a number of pivotal events took place. The 1956 war with the UK, France, and Israel. 56, four years. Internal interference in the politics of Egypt that made him feel increasingly insecure. A buildup, military buildup on the Israeli side, which, an interference by the US in a number of countries politically, which added to his own sense and that of the military around him, sense of insecurity, sense of vulnerability. And fourth, an important loan that Abdel Nasser wanted, requested, and lobbied strongly for through the World Bank to build the, Aswan, the great Aswan Dam that was eventually turned down. Abdel Nasser turned to the Soviet Union, started his own military buildup, started interfering in neighboring countries that he viewed to be pro the US or pro Israel, and engaged in one of the most irresponsible socialist experiments in the late 1950s that changed the mandate of the revolution from being one of changing the game at the top to being one about nationalization of assets, dispossession of the private sector, control of the political space, and mobilization of the revolution in every corner of Egypt. So how we conduct ourselves vis-a-vis -vis these fragile, vulnerable countries from the outside can play a role in helping to steer these revolutions in a completely different and maybe the wrong direction. Would that be a fair way of answering your question without answering it, actually? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Paul Hayward Smith. Thanks, Ralph, for that question, which is a lead into mine. Um, will you, in, 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 in future uh, lectures such as this, include in your um, fe features as to the causes of the Arab Spring the negative impact of US foreign policy over the last 60 years, not only in support of the, of the occupation of Palestine, but the, um, the propping up of corrupt regimes such as in Egypt by an annual payment to the military, the cozying up of, of the United States to regimes such as Saudi Arabia uh, and Bahrain and other uh, such uh, states. It, with respect, it seems to me that these issues uh, are far more significant than many of the ones that you earlier raised. Uh, fair question and uh, a fair point. I don't minimize the role of external actors in what happens in the region. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, I will single-handedly, in, in, in my own country, Libya, uh, hold the US responsible for prolonging the misery of of the Libyan people uh, over the 42 years where, during which Gaddafi had ruled. Nor do I underestimate the weight of the Arab-Israeli conflict and the geopolitics that had polluted debates, uh, created instability when it wasn't needed, and prolonged the volatility throughout the region. Uh, but I think as we move forward and building on the last comment, the Arab Spring has been about the region taking matters in its own hands, the timing it shows in a modality it imposed. 
And that is what's incredibly empowering about the Arab Spring as opposed to the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Uh, Iraq did not emerge, uh, I'd say, confident, empowered, intact with a national project, if anything. I think Iraq was further broken by the conduct, the manner in which uh, Saddam Hussein was removed. So um, part of the excitement about the Arab Spring is that, as I said, for a, I'd like to go back even further. I, I just know of the last 200 years plus, I cannot think of a genuine grassroots, bottom-up, spontaneous removal of a despot that was done by people in the region. What took place in the 50s were largely coups orchestrated by the U.S. and others, often at the expense of public opinion and against the public will. I think the U.S. will have to adjust and learn and accommodate this change and hopefully not resist it and fight it. I just, I don't think the U.S. is in the mood now. I don't think they care. If tomorrow they woke up in the morning and they were told that Egypt is stable, economically they're doing okay, they're going to get by. They're not going to fight anyone. They're going to get by. They're not going to ask you for more money. Uh, Egypt, in fact, will play a regional role in helping to solve the Arab-Israeli conflict and uh, that, in fact, might take some of the pressure off of you. I think they'll be happy with this. The weight of what is happening internally in a number of these countries is so overwhelming, in my humble opinion, and I, I, I stand to be corrected, that it's going to be up to the people of the region now, or at least a, a big chunk of their destiny is going to be determined by what they do. Now, I'm asking the outside world to help as opposed to interfere. And I hope the outside world has learned from the lessons, including the ones you've just noted, that you could bet on the apparent stability and longevity of a lot of the dictatorships you see around, but that is often frail, thin. These regimes, by their nature, by construction, are incredibly vulnerable, fragile, and might crack. And hence, I think that is the precedent that the Arab Spring has set for everybody else. Who would have thought the day would come when the term, the Arab Spring, the term of a revolution in the Arab world, would become the model that people would invoke in the US, in Russia, in China. The Arab term, uh, Arab, the, uh, the term Arab Spring in Chinese is not searchable, it's, uh, it's sort of, I think it's one of those censored terms. I think an incredible mo a potential pivotal moment of change that we're witnessing. Uh, and I'm pointing to its fragility and weakness, but I, I, do, I don't want the party to end yet. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> My question is about uh, Europe, and you alluded to the role of Europe. I'm particularly interested in um, your thoughts about uh, what uh, countries in the Mediterranean area uh, who have had uh, historically and culturally a lot to do with the Arab world. I'm thinking of countries like Spain, Portugal, Italy, Malta, Greece. I think they have a role to play. Um, but I'll be honest with you, I have been, and again I'm, I'm relaying what I hear from policymakers in <coughs> Egypt and Tunisia, the sense of disappointment that a lot of the initial exuberance and pronouncements of support and willingness to aid these countries have proven to be half empty, uh, little uh, in terms of the substance they have implied on the ground. Uh, this is possibly a function of what Europe is going through also. Uh, but once Europe is able to uh, hopefully recover, I think there is a lot more in Europe that goes even beyond issues of trade, labor mobility, foreign direct investment. There are issues that have to do with the very future of the European model of welfare. Uh, I studied this quite extensively many years ago and like many others happened to believe that the structure of societies in the Arab world, state, the relationship between the state and the individual and the market was largely influenced by European blueprints post World War II was wholesale in some cases important and adapted. Now it was taken to an extreme, radical extreme, 
but these are European blueprints. And so what happens in Europe to this particular uh, balance between the state and the market, issues of economic security and guarantees of welfare, I think is going to have a lot of implications. But there are other things that, that can be done and can be done immediately. You know, when we talk about e Tunisia's needs, economic needs right now, financing needs, to be able to stay, remain stable and avoid potentially a financial crisis, we're not talking about billions. We're talking possibly about hundreds of millions of dollars that would go a long way. And even those amounts are not forthcoming. I would actually argue that the rich countries of the Arab world, especially in the Gulf, have a responsibility here. One of the few, they're one group of countries that have immense financial wealth that ought to be invested, that ought to essentially pave, uh, pave the way for these countries to stay stable. And they are also not forthcoming in the way that they should. There's a collective responsibility here. Now, you could understand the reasons why some countries might be reluctant. What they're seeing happen in Tunis and Egypt and Libya and Syria and Yemen and Morocco may not necessarily be something they feel completely comfortable with. So, another, one way of summarizing all of this is to say there is an incredible vacuum of leadership at this moment to think about the Arab Spring to think about what can be done and to actually do it. No one is championing this issue in a way that they should or ought to, given the potential consequences. Now imagine a financial crisis in Egypt, which is not a, an event with zero probability. I would in fact suggest that Egypt is possibly more vulnerable to a financial crisis now, much more so than just six months ago. Who's thinking about this? Who's offering options, who's engaged with the Egyptians at this moment of immense uncertainty. My name is Kazem, I'm from UniSA. I've got two questions. First, the upsurge in Middle East started more than two and a half years ago in Iran after the outcome of election was stolen by the government and it was ruthlessly cracked down. Do you see any uh, interaction between that upsurge in Iran and the Arab Spring. The uh, second question is, don't you think the outcome of revolution in Libya and in, in uh, Egypt is already stolen by the West and United States? I mean, the government which is coming to power in, in Libya, is it going to be anything more than a puppet of United States? As it happened in, uh, in Afghanistan and in, in Iraq and uh, just because of the oil in, in Libya, NATO interfered, and uh, you know, all that uh, dreadful destruction there, what's happening in Syria is far worse than what happened in Libya, but they are not doing anything because there's, not, there's no oil there. So the major concern of the West there is one is the safety and security and existence of, uh, of uh, Israel, and two is the, is, is the oil. So there is no oil in, in Egypt, but they are neighbors of Israel, and Libya has got the oil, a more or less neighbor, but Syria, uh, you know, there's no oil, and uh, uh, thousands of people have been killed, and nobody is you know, worried about that. Thank you. I will never try to outdo anyone who wants to blame the West for everything that has happened the other day. I just choose to focus on what I understand best and where I think my own agency as an individual, as an actor in these societies and what that implies. I mean, that, so I, I don't think we diametrically necessarily disagree. I just happen to think we control our destiny now more so than at any other moment. And on Libya, I can assure you, partly because I'm from there and I follow events, if we fail, it will be because we failed as Libyans. It is completely in our hands. And the fact that we're underperforming in so many ways relative to what people expected, our own people have expected, is really a reflection of our own ineptitude, incompetence, lack of focus, and a 42-year legacy where the previous dictator left literally nothing to build on.
I just happen to think this is a moment when I, I've got an opportunity to do it. Now, if along the way I have to sell oil and I have to deal with regional and superpowers and if I can get the most out of this relationship, I'm, I'm not going to say no, if anything. I want more of that. I think projects right now for a country like Libya, like technical assistance, transfer of know-how, how to build, I mean, we're not talking rocket science. Uh, in a place like Libya, we have kids. I mean, we took a poll in one of the recent events that was organized, and we asked a lot of Libyan youth, what's your number one priority? We want to learn English. Who's going to do this? Given that for at least 30 years, the language was prohibited from being a language spoken in public or at conferences. I think a lot of the things the West can do for us are actually things we want, we need. We just need to focus on them and ask specifically for them. My biggest fear in Libya right now is not that people will steal our oil, it's that we will waste more oil and find at the end of the day a country that is more broken, more failed, than we found it when we had a chance. Thank you. We're very proud of the fact that we have an international center for Muslim and non-Muslim understanding in this university, uh, a research center of excellence. And I'm going to give a question moment to its director, um, Professor Salman Saeed, thank you. Thank you very much, now, Liz. I don't know what to say after all that introduction. Um, I guess um, there are several points in your talk which I found, you know, it's very difficult not to be sort of um, encouraged by these events. But you kept on saying, um, we don't want interference, but we want help. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me kind of a difference between tomato and tomato. Um, <laughs> so, and I'm just kind of curious how you actually negotiate that difference there. And I think that just links to a broader point, um, and that is to do with how unique the so-called Arab Spring is, not just in relation to the history of the 20th century, but into wider transformations, which have always been done by young people, so it's not that unique. When it comes to fighting, it's mainly done by young people. You don't find many septuagarians taking to the streets. Um, you know, just probably one of the good houses of it growing older. You don't have to do those sorts of things. So I'm not quite sure what the uniqueness of it is. And as a number of speakers have actually pointed out, we are still in a situation where things haven't been settled, and you also mentioned this point there. But it seems to me that surely if it's about a liberation, then maybe one way is to be careful about Greeks bearing gifts, and in relation to, for example, even question of aid, and assistance hasn't really been beneficial in most places and there is no reason to assume that it would be beneficial even in this situation. I agree with all the above. Uh, <laughs> uh, let, me be, let me be clear what I meant by, I used the term aid once. Uh, Tunisia has a vibrant tourism sector or used to have one. I encourage everyone to consider going to Tunis got fantastic infrastructure, caters mostly to the European market. Not a single individual after the revolution has been harmed in Tunis, not a single tourist. And yet their tourism proceeds are probably down 80%. For them, that's a lifeline. They've, they're staring at a two billion US dollar gap in tourism proceeds and I don't know who's going to fill that gap. So what I meant by aid is possibly a short-term plug into this budget to allow this government to at least buy itself some time. I certainly agree with you that the structural dependent relationship of aid, especially in the manner that it was done before, is not something that we would want, nor do we want our countries to get used to. The problem in Egypt is most of the aid went to the military or through military-related and owned entities. That fundamentally has to change. And I think a, a new aid paradigm, perhaps, is one, one way for us to think about the needs of some of these big countries, where even under the best of circumstances, 
unless there is some assistance or economic carrots or markets that are open. I mean, I'm, I'm not telling every European, please write a check to Egypt. I'm saying just open up this market for them to be able to export more. Don't do it for the next 20 years. I understand you cannot do it. Do it for the next three years. <coughs> Offer them uh, opportunities that allow them to reorient uh, some of the engines of economic growth, maybe have some economic activities that allow them to diversify and buy themselves some time until they sort through all of this. So I certainly agree with you. And on Libya, uh, you know, the UN had an experience in Libya in 1951. When Libya gained independence, in what the New York Times had labeled at the time as one of the most irresponsible decisions ever made by the UN. It was an accidental state. Libya didn't have three, four individuals who actually had gone to school. The UN's track record at the time when it focused only on what? On technical assistance for state building was incredibly successful. I don't want the UN running our judiciary in Libya or deciding who wins in politics or not. But if on some of the core things that the, that the UN can do, has done, they can focus on offering that help. I think that is what I'd say it is not only welcome, it's actually needed. I think the difference in the, the problems with aid have invariably been not about the aid per se, the con, uh, or the, the flows of it, or the magnitude of it. It has been about the governance of aid. Who manages the aid? Is it open? Is it accountable? Does it go to the right people? Do we even measure when it works and when it doesn't? Uh, I only say this because I have to defend also the, the line of work that I'm in. Uh, I run a small foundation slash social enterprise that invests in Arab youth. And so I go into countries like Tunis and Egypt and I help fund incubators or small and medium-sized enterprises or microfinance programs. I think some of those interventions are worthy of being uh, supported and welcome, partly because, like you, I am uh, not comfortable with the traditional model of aid, especially as it was deployed historically in a number of countries. We want to give Dr. Yusuf a proper Australian thank you. So I'm going to call upon Brenton Caffin, who is Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Centre for Social Innovation to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Brenton. I know people have to get home, so I'm going to keep this brief. Dr. Yusuf, it's been a privilege to listen to your analysis, and it's been an inspiration to listen to your prognosis. And I, for one, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room, are equally excited and interested to watch this story unfold. So on behalf of the audience and the organisers, thank you very much. Thank you.